Welcome to the Jennifer J. Hammond Podcast. Jennifer is a licensed realtor, educator, speaker, and best-selling author. Jennifer's goal is to help you find your yay in every day. Jennifer is grateful for the opportunity to educate, empower, and inspire you with powerful conversations, insights, and new viewpoints. Here's your host, Jennifer J. Hammond. is Marcy Miles Clark. She uh, She's an MBA. She's an author. She's a healthpreneur, you know, like an entrepreneur, but a healthpreneur. But she's also a fellow licensed realtor. Yay! And I think we work so hard. She's life and health insurance consultant and 20-year pharmaceutical industry veteran. She's also known as the praying wife, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But first of all, one thing that you're going to share is four key practical financial resources, which with the pandemic and everything else that's going on, real estate is something that people just really, they don't understand how it can be used to help them in emergencies, especially because of COVID-19. People, there were some people who just saw the worst side of real estate and they, they've they just been so freaked out about it. So, so let's dive in right there. Those, what are some of the practical tips that people could have? Yes, Jennifer. So some of the practical tips um, in general are just, you know, having um, a personal physician, health insurance, you know, having your living wills, power of attorneys, as well as your death uh, insurances as well, Um, your final expense, your burials. But from a real estate perspective, I would say some of the most important uh, benefits of being able to leverage your real estate in a crisis, a couple of things. You can, first of all, use the equity in your home. And I'm sure if you all listen to Jennifer, you know what equity is. Basically, the value of your home, right, minus what you owe. So if you your home is valued at 100000 which is very modest in this area, a line of credit. I mean, there were so many people who were just cash strapped last year. And it made all of the difference. Um, you know, And if you had the opportunity to be able to leverage some of that equity in your home, you could very well, you know, be able to utilize some of that equity for cash, liquidated cash. Secondly, rental income, very important. And my husband and I, you know, we're empty nesters and we have a nice size house. We're always forward thinking and we say, babe, if we ever get in a financial bond, we can always rent out a portion of our home, whether it's our basement or... I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things that I tell people is if you, you know, you are empty nesters, one of the mm-hmm. things you might want to consider is either short-term rental, and maybe you do it through mm-hmm. one of the Airbnbs or the vacation rentals by owner, or you may just find a college or a university that's close to you. Absolutely. And you might find people who come in for three months for an internship or things of Absolutely. that nature. So what are some of the ideas that you have that you, have you rented out your house? We have not rented out our home, but we definitely would if the opportunity presented itself, you know, I mean, we pretty much, we use most of the space in our home, but again, if it got to a point where either we didn't use it or we needed to utilize it, you know, to be able to leverage the cash, we would, and we've already even worked out a a contingent plan. So we have a pretty nice size basement. We also have an independent in-law suite, which is really a freestanding apartment. It's a one bedroom apartment. And so we know, you know, we do have colleges nearby. And so we do know, just like Jennifer said, that we could leverage both of those spaces, you know, with no problem and probably easily get, you know, an extra thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month. And I think that would make, you know, a significant difference if we got into a bond. Well, so, and the, other, I, the other one I want to mention really fast is because so often people, they forget about colleges and universities. But yeah. also, if you are anywhere close to a hospital, Yes. Nurses and doctors are often they are assigned to a hospital for a couple months yes. or for a year or even a six month. And it's amazing if you just go to and find out, you know, do they have a board or do they have a lot of times it's an internal thing here yes. in Washington, D.C. One of the ones um, that's internal is the World Bank. 
Yes, they yes. are constantly looking for um, some kind of a version of a short term rental and something that's very easy, whether it's a three month, a six month. And those are a little mm -hmm. bit harder to find in many markets. Mm -hmm. and, and people coming from another area, a lot of times really Absolutely. love to be in um, a residential area where they're either, mm -hmm. they have their own bedroom and bathroom, but they're in a homey kind of feeling because it's so much nicer than just staying in a hotel, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and again, like in this particular case, if you have like an apartment or a freestanding unit um, that you can actually rent and it be aside from your family and your personal space, you can out for someone like a kitchen and, you know, a lot of resources, like Jennifer said, you know, amenities, if you have a pool and those kind of things. And people seem to gravitate, especially if they're there for longer term, towards more of a homely setting, like you said, opposed to a hotel. So we definitely advocate all those things. And another thing that came to mind, Jennifer, while we were talking, is actually utilizing your house. I mean, probably, you know, there's different schools of thoughts, but you could do, you know, maybe like, um, a boarding home, you know, different rooms in your home. Um, that's something else. Another thing that came to mind, a crash pad, because <laughs> we have three airports in this area, right? And so there's a lot of flight attendants who come and go, and they need places to stay as well. They're very transient. And so that may also be, you know, an additional income stream that you could consider for one of your properties or your home and leveraging, you know, cash as needed. Also, and very well um, said, because obviously, yeah. as you know, in the Washington, D.C. area, we have three airports here. So all of us are yeah. close to at least one of the three, if That's not right. all three. Again, as a crash pad, flight attendants, a lot of times they will, if you have a house and it's you have three bedrooms, you'll end up with three flight attendants or two flight attendants mm -hmm. and, a, and one of the pilots. And they just want to come in, obviously, as you know, it's funny because sometimes we get worried about the word crash pad. But right. really because they're just looking for a place where they can relax and they prefer a homey at a, um, atmosphere rather than a hotel just because yeah. it's it's a homey atmosphere, right? Yeah. And they're professionals. They have a job. So you know that they can pay, right? You right. Know that they're responsible. They have to get up and go somewhere. So they're not going to be there indefinitely. So I really like that idea. Well, I think those are great. So it's important to know that real estate can be used in those ways and it can be flexible, especially in times of emergency. But I think one of the things that you said that I think is so important is to just think outside the box. Because really? sometimes, you know, we get stuck in our just our regular patterns and we forget to think outside the box, right? Exactly, exactly. And it really helps to formulate these plans ahead of time proactively. Sometimes, you know, when stress is on, it makes it really hard to think out the box. And so I like to have, you know, contingent plans just in case things go awry, we can kind of fall back on things. So one of the other things you talked about with those four um, key practical and financial resources, number one, of course, real estate always is and owning yes. your own real estate and learning to leverage it, whichever way you do. But you also talked about, um, you know, different insur living insurances, you know, one of the things yes. And, and like the living will, that is something you know, mm -hmm. I just recently was looking into because of my father and I realized, wow, that needs to be updated regularly. Yes. I think that's yes. another thing people overlook is they think, oh, I did that will over a gone ago, or I've done that living will, it's all signed, but then they don't realize, oh, that was three years ago. And maybe right. on your state, it's not valid right. anymore. Right. And things change, your wishes change. Sometimes, you know, your family expands. You know, maybe you had a child since the last time you updated your will and you want to include your kids or your grandchildren. So all different things, you know, um, as we get older, our wishes change. And maybe when we were younger, we said, you know what, if something happens to me and I become incapacitated, I don't want to be, you know, revived. But as you get or when you're younger, sometimes you say you do want to be revived because, you know, you can't imagine yourself dying. But right. when you're older, sometimes your wishes change and you say, you know what? I'm just going to go with it. You know, if something happens to me, then just let it be, you know. But the key is really, like Jennifer said, is staying current with your wishes and making sure that you have in writing all of your desires, you know, making sure that your family knows those wishes so that they can carry them out accordingly. And, you know, one thing, um, Marcy, I would love for you to share any tips that you have for having that hard conversation. Because even with my father, I've realized, wow. Sometimes it's really hard to get him. I mean, one, it's hard for me to go, okay, so let's talk about your death. 
you know, yes. I mean, and I, I try to use humor sometimes, but what kind of tips can you have to help someone have that conversation? Yeah, so I'm the family caregiver. I've been since 13 years old, started taking care of my mother, then my husband, he was sick recently, as well as my grandmother, who's 95 years old. So I'm probably the ideal person to have this conversation because I've had it a number of times, unfortunately. But really, you know, the conversation really just looks like, hey, you know, mom, dad, husband, you know, I really just want to make sure that your wishes are carried out, you know. It, it just put it back on them. You want to make sure that their desires are communicated accordingly. And who wouldn't want that, you know? And so it's all about the person and just making sure that their wishes are known. And I would just keep it, you know, very conversational. Sometimes people don't like to hear about those things. Um, and you can kind of gauge what's the best time. You know, I don't know if I would want to bust out and have this conversation with my husband in the middle of you know, the World Series or the Super Bowl, you know, that's probably not a good time to have this conversation, you know, but maybe over dinner or a relaxing environment, whatever the opportunity presents itself. But I strongly encourage you to have these conversations sooner than later. Yeah, I think that it's one of those ones where people keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it yeah. off and, and then yeah. it doesn't happen until it's, it's, you're in a situation where you can't have the conversation because they're right. sick or they're ill or, something right. of that nature. So one other thing I wanted to, before I want us to talk about COVID-19 and what happened with you and your husband, but before we get there, you're also a licensed real estate agent. And I got to tell yes. you, this is year 2021 yes. and it has got to be the wildest year for those of us in the DMV, which is Washington, yes. Maryland and Virginia area yes. as licensed real estate agents. Oh my gosh, this is a very wild time. So yeah. Talk a little bit about your experience. What's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a seller's market. And so the inventory is very low. If you put a house on the market and it's priced accordingly, you'll get multiple offers in days, sometimes same day. Um, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, just kind of depending on, you know, which side you're representing. If you're a seller, it's great because in many cases, you know, you're getting overbid. So people are paying more than value for the property. They are waiving disclosures, disclaimers, and, you know, uh, sometimes appraisals if they have cash. And, and um, it's really just, you know, easier, you know, for the seller per se. But if you are moving to this area, you know, if you're selling one property and then you end up being a buyer, then you're on the other side of it where, you know, you're now, you know, in you're now inheriting a bunch of uh, competition. And so, you know, there's multiple offers again, and sometimes you have to go out of your comfort zone. You have to be very, very quick. And, you know, you have to be very witty in terms of what you put in your contract to get your contract accepted. So, you know, you can't ask for closing costs or any concessions or anything like that because of the person next to you, if all things are equal, and they're not asking for anything, then they're going to be the ones that get the bid. So there's a lot of things going on. It's very interesting. Um, I've actually been, you know, licensed for over 15, 20 years now. So I've seen a couple of different markets. And this kind of reminds me of the market in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's great. Yes, it is, especially if you're, you know, you own because you've just seen your values just soar, you know? And so this is a really good sign to own property. Like you said, if you need to leverage it or if you're cashing out, um, if you are retiring or you're downsizing, especially from this area or another high price market, and you're going to a lower price market, like somewhere like in Florida or down, you know, South where your money goes a lot further. I mean, you're, you're just like golden, you know, you have cash, you can have a couple hundred thousand dollars easily. And, you know, just plunk it down on something else. And before you know it, you can end up, you know, with a, a property actually mortgage free that you own free and clear just from the equity in your current property. So, you know, it's a great place to be. I'm just, you know, hoping and praying that, you know, it will last and, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, they say what goes up must come down. So that's yeah. the kind of scary side of it. Yeah. Yeah, we and we all want to make sure that everybody is protected and safe. So it's, yes. I think it's also, I feel like being a licensed real estate agent, we're also a little bit of, you know, like the role of caretaker, role of wife or mother. We want to make sure all of our, our clients, all of our customers and our clients are just loved and taken care of. And so we do hope that this market, um, 
takes care of people because I know it's pretty tough for buyers right now. And some of them, yeah. like they've been through a washing machine. With yeah. All the kind of ups and downs that are out there. But I don't yeah. want to run out of time before we talk about, you know, you you're, you got a book. You wrote a book already, Praying Wife, Healed Husband. And yes. so this comes out of a story from COVID-19, from this crazy yes. Um, pandemic year 2020, when both you and your husband both got COVID-19. So That's will right. you share your story? Sure, sure. So, you know, for the sake of time, I'll give you the abbreviated version. And of course, if you're interested, you know, you can always visit our website, which is present, prayingwifehelps.com, as well as any of our media and all of our handles are Praying Wife Helps. But our book is actually called Praying Wife, Healed Husband, How We Survived a Death-Defying COVID-19 Experience. And in a nutshell, uh, my husband and I both um, contracted COVID early on in the pandemic last spring, March of 2020. And like I said, we're empty nesters, you know, we have a good life and, um, you know, we travel and, you know, we're, we're very transient. And so we have no idea to this day where we contracted COVID, but nevertheless, um, in a very short time period, uh, my husband became deathly ill. I, on the other hand, remained pretty mild. And so um, at the beginning of the pandemic, because there were so many unknowns, of course, I was unable to see him. So he ended up um, having to have an emergency intubation at Johns Hopkins. So he was put on the ventilator literally after days of being diagnosed with COVID um, just because his lungs were literally failing. Wow. And um, like I said, my husband has been an athlete all his life through high school and through college. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, he's pretty healthy, healthy 56 year, 56 year old. I'm sorry, he's 57 now. And I am 48. I was 47 at the time. And so in many cases, you know, we were just not the ones that you ever would have, you know, thought would, that this would have happened to, but nevertheless, it did. And so, um, Thank God, you know, uh, we had a lot of different resources, um, including a lot of the ones that I talked about. And a lot of those resources really just helped us, you know, to get on the other side of things. So uh, my husband actually ended up in Johns Hopkins for a total of 46 days, and he was on the ventilator for 28 days. During that time period, he was in a medically induced coma, and he was not expected to live. That's how severe, you know, his sickness was. And the scary part, is that it just all came out of the blue, like overnight, you know? I mean, it started off literally as like, presented like flu symptoms. And the next thing you know, you know, he had a a fever and he ended up developing this really terrible cough. And so throughout the week, you know, everything else got better, but that cough just, you know, did not subside. So I was in touch with his physician who urged me on the Friday um, of, you know, literally a week after the onset of our symptoms, And three days after being diagnosed, he urged me to get him to the hospital immediately Mm -hmm. just to have a CAT scan. And we thought he would just have, you know, some kind of treatment or medications and, you know, be sent on his way. Literally, I couldn't go in because I had COVID. So we were double jeopardy. So I had to drop him off at the curb at the emergency room. And I sat in my car and waited for him to come back out. Well, that never happened. I got a call from the doctor telling me that my husband, you know, his lungs were a lot worse than they envisioned. And they needed my permission to do emergency intubation. So that was the beginning of our story. And, uh, you know, the rest is really history. I mean, it's um, been a year and a half now. Um, Like I said, you know, we prayed my husband literally, literally back on his feet. You know, when I was at home, um, I started a prayer group, which really just spread like wildfire, became international. And we literally prayed. And when we prayed, his body would literally respond. And I was at home literally just charting out his progress, you know, really as a means of staying sane and organized. And every time I would talk to one of his healthcare providers during that time, I would just write down, you know, his baseline from where he was the last time to where he is now. I was also journaling. That's just something to me that's very therapeutic, um, especially in, you know, in downtime. So I was journaling just kind of, you know, my thoughts and just really um, just staying, again, sane and organized. And I was also sending out <clears throat> um, a variety of texts to my prayer group. And so when my husband ended up recovering um, in May, he came home from the hospital. We had a lot of media coverage because he was so sick and he wasn't expected to make it. And he had made such a miraculous recovery um, in such a short period of time. And also, you know, so early on in the pandemic when there were so many question marks. 
And I have to point out that at that time, there were no medications. There was no, you know, monoclonal antibodies, no vaccines, of course, no remdesivir, none of that stuff. As my bishop said, it was just his body and God just fighting it out. And so, you know, we prayed and literally, you know, he came out of um, his coma um, right before like Easter Sunday, uh, right after Easter Sunday, I'm sorry. And he was, you know, he came off the ventilator and then he had to go through a series of, you know, major restoration for, you know, a few uh, months at a hospital. And then he was able to come home. Um, on May 6th, which was the day after our anniversary. So just a lot of stories. And, um, you know, someone um, ended up just telling me, actually a couple of someone urged me to put my story into a book. Yeah. And, and I said, you know what? It's not really far-fetched because I had the content. I had a binder like this thick, you yeah. know, of, of all of my notes and, and everything. And so I had never, you know, written a book. Um, I had planned to write a book at some point, probably on real estate or life yeah. insurance, or, you know, something like that. I would never have thought that I would write a book in 2020, nor would I have ever guessed that it would have been my survival story. But things work, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And so we ended up, you know, basically putting our story together. Um, I told the story. It's a faith based memoir. Um, but I was led to actually give resources. So there is a section in the book that's called Good Resources. And I wanted to really just share uh, the resources that allowed us to be able to win so that others too could be able to win if, you know, they were able in this ever in the same predicament. And so, you know, it's all about just proper planning and, you know, proactive planning. And so I really just talk about, you know, the importance of spiritual resources, you know, faith and prayers and meditation, journaling, all those good things. But then, you know, I go a lot further and talk about the practical and the financial resources like Jennifer and I discussed, you know, personal physician and having health insurance and living wills, power of attorneys. I mean, these were all the things that we had in place that really, really made the difference in my husband's outcome, you know. And so I really, truly, um, I can't overemphasize the importance of proactive planning. And, and having uh, resources. I think what you said, resources. I think it's so important. Yeah, having make resources. sure you have resources. So make sure, so people know it, the website is prayingwifehelps.com. So if you're listening to us, it's prayingwifehelps.com. Remember the video, this the whole interview is up on YouTube if you're listening to us. So, yes. and the, the book is Praying Wife Healed Husband. And they can yes. get that on Amazon, right? Yes, it's on Amazon, Key Books, um, BarnesandNobles.com, and any online retailer, book retailer. Well, I want to say I hope that God continues to bless you and your husband and keeps you safe and healthy. Yes. And thank you for inspiring others and yes. sharing your wisdom. And as I say at the end of every episode, please raise your voice and say yay with me. Yay! Yay! Perfect. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Canfield. You may know me as the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And if you want more help in getting from where you are to where you want to be, I want to encourage you to listen to the Jennifer Hammond Show 